Hey. Jagged little pill. Hey. hey. Swimming hey. in your stomach. Huh? What did we get in the mail today? Stop. You know what I mean. We got a postcard from guess who? <laughs> guess who? Who? Diary of a family! Woo! Right up there, I'm gonna link their channel. Well, first of all, it's from Virginia City, Nevada. And we haven't been there yet, so that's a cool place on our destination list. It says, Dear Tim and Gracie and Crystal, see our view. From Virginia City, howdy. Thank you for being a part of our DFAM. We hope you are taking advantage of all the amazing places the United States has to offer. We hope to see you out there on the road. God bless and live life intentionally. Heart Diary of a Family. Thank cool. you guys. Hi folks, I'm Tim, the dad. Hi. You are? Me. <laughs> and we're on our way to go meet with a fun family to do an interview. Stay tuned to find out who and who they are and what their purpose is and where they've been and where they're going and all that good stuff. Tempe, come over here. Just come right here. All right, Daddy's gonna have to carry you. You're gonna have to hold her. She keeps trying to dig her something in. Oh. <laughs> now you're shy? Why are you shy all of a sudden? You were just showing her all your toys and your bike. She's hiding behind Rory. <laughs> we're not gonna do it. This is not normal. She's normally not the shy one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. Tegan. How old are you, Tegan? Boy. I mean, rubber band, rubber band. We're here with. We're a party of seven. I'm, I'm Jamie. I'm Daryl. Their oldest, Rory, Coulter, Tempe, Rylan, Move Rory, and Tegan. <laughs> <laughs> and so you guys, are seven of you, yes. Uh, yes. full time in the RV? Yes. Awesome. How long have you been? We've been, well, collectively about five years. Well, we've been doing it in the RV since September of, not last year, the year before. So it'll be two years of September. Yeah. So that's in the RV. Before that we did, I had Hotels. a couple different jobs that would we would travel with. And so we did hotels, we did tent camping, so kind of just about everything. So. You actually did tent camping? Yes. yes. We did that for a while. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we did it full time for <laughs> May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Just nine months. Wow. So it was a combination of tent camping, staying with friends, relatives, and then hotels. Yeah, so it wasn't constant. You have plans on doing uh, like YouTube or anything else in the future? Yes, we are working on jump starting our YouTube channel now. We have the channel set up. Um, there's a couple of older videos on it from a few years ago, um, but we're going to revamp the entire thing in the next few weeks to get. Uh, new content up. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> they, we, we, it was kind of a, a transition that went into it. So we actually started um, going into it with the tent camping. I, I lost my job and we ended up losing our house at the same time. It was kind of like a serendipity kind of thing. Um, we, we, we were renting and we were talking to the owners of the house and we said, hey, let's um, let's talk about renewing the lease and everything. I said, oh, we're not going to renew it. We're going to sell the house. And we're like, okay. So it was kind of like, no job. We that was last minute, too. We had yeah. like 30 days to yeah. get out. It was less so. than 30 days. It was like three weeks. Yeah. I remember. And so it was kind of like a, a 
Well, going and talking about transition, um, at that point when we had started with his previous job, he was traveling 360 days out of the year. And so we eventually just put our stuff in storage and started traveling with him. Um, so putting it up in that perspective, a lot of the kids have been on the road since they were like one, two years old. Um, I think the only one who wasn't on like comfortable with being on the road was Rylan because he was born when we settled down into our house in Dallas and um, it wasn't it was three years I think he was three years old yeah when we um, when we decided to go full-time again but he had the easiest transition probably of all because he's really outdoorsy he loves hiking and traveling exploring yeah. Coulter, so you actually kind of more flourished as a result of the traveling. Yeah, Coulter did too. Um, Coulter was nonverbal, um, autistic, high-functioning autistic, and it wasn't until we started traveling that he just kind of started opening it up and started talking more. You could see like things, just watching him watch how things work whenever we we're going out and visiting different places, museums. You could just see like things clicking for him, and he's finally starting to understand a lot of stuff. He flourished a lot too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but even then, the older kids, they were pretty used to the traveling as well. Because the job I had before that, we were we were stationary for about three years. Well, not, not even that, maybe two years. Yeah. I don't know. But it, before that, I actually worked another job that was traveling quite a bit. And that kind of what, that's really what kind of kick-started the traveling for us. Um, because, again, I was, I was, the job that I had, I had to be gone for three weeks at a time. And then I'd be back for sometimes only like a couple days and then be out for like another three weeks. And so the, we did the first one, and it was kind of chaos at home, yeah. just with everything. It was nuts. Um, so she would call me like throughout the day. She'd be like, "Okay, this is going on," and stuff like that. And we were, Coulter was high functioning autism, and so that played a lot into that. The change in routine. He and was so, two, and he was not handling dad being gone. Yeah. And then I had a four year old and a newborn, and I was doing all of that by myself all the time. And it's just, I remember. One night, it was just, it was too much. I packed up our bags, loaded it up, and, like, the first thing the next morning, I called him, like, we're coming out to you. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, so I'm at work, and I'm like, uh, okay, <laughs> I'll be safe, I'll see you. <laughs> but when everything happened, we were like, okay, well, now where, where do we go? Where do we do? We can't, you know, I didn't have right. a job, so it's like, well, I can't, I can't get into an apartment because you need proof of income you can't buy a house even though we were close mm -hmm. um, we cool. found one place we were working with a realtor and she said just get me a an offer letter that doesn't show any conditions on it and we can get you into this house and we're like, great it's awesome and so but then it just never came through it's never worked out so so we ended up moving out and then we were kind of just left with okay where, where do we go what do we do and we had all this camping stuff in storage and it never said, got used. Yeah, we never really used it. And so we were like, let's just pull it all out. Let's let's set up a week of camping and let's see what happens. And so we did that. I started driving with Lyft and Uber. And it it was then, it was like that within a couple of days it clicked. And it was like, wait a minute. I don't have, we don't have to pay on a house. We don't have to pay, you know. Lawn maintenance. Lawn, you know, all that stuff. It's like, okay, so I don't have yeah. to. Because I was, I was trying to, I was looking at my salary that was now gone. And I was like, okay, well, that's what I need back in order for us to be able to continue to live. But then we looked at it, it was like, well, now that we don't have the house, there's all this extra income that's kind of, like, I don't have to make as much if we do this. And so we said, let's see what we can do. And it just started working out. We started traveling around Texas. Um, and then it wasn't until we ended up in South Padre Island, we met another family. And that at that, for, at that time, we were kind of just trying to, I don't know, stay sane. <laughs> I don't know. Try, just trying to let's just keep going. Let's you know. Let's let's keep things positive. You know, and yeah. and it was working out. Um, but then we met a family. They had twelve kids, and they were full timing in an RV. And we were like, oh my gosh. And then we we our, of course our kids clicked, and so they started playing together. We started meeting with the family. We became friends with them, and um, and they were the ones that told us about full time families. And then that's when we were like, okay, so we're not crazy. We're not this crazy. This is a we like, This is okay. It looks like you also know Barbara Rhodes and her yes. family. We've met them out in California. They're awesome folks. Yes. yes. yes Blaine and amazing. Alan are really good friends with our kids. Yeah. So. Yes. So I was an elementary and secondary education major. Um, and when Rory was born, she had some health issues that required me to jump out of like drop out of school my last semester and 
Um, we had problems. She was on a breathing machine, iron treatments. I mean, constantly going down to downtown Houston twice a week for blood tests. And um, it just got to be too much. Nobody wanted to take her for daycare. And so I was just like, well, I'll be a single mom. And from there, it just kind of, I've naturally just decided I was going to homeschool my kids. I was homeschooled. I had the qualifications to teach. And so I figured if I had to stay at home, I might as well put my yes my time to use and so um we do kind of a version of traditional schooling for math and reading um sometimes if we're stationary for a long period of time we'll just do uh textbooks for the rest of the subjects as well but for history and science we generally do an unschooling approach so we do a lot of uh national parks we do a lot of uh nature uh, preserves and nature trails and science museums and um, living history stuff and yeah, yeah. homeschool so. through Rebecca I'm familiar with the curriculum um, it does match our uh, religious beliefs some it's simple it's um, I think the big draw for me is with Coulter with his high functioning autism it's pretty it's simple step by step um, and he he does really well with it. Um, other curriculums, I don't know that he would do yeah. really well I mean, with. They, so. they, the, what, what I like watching about them is they actually they want to learn. Yeah. They, they want to do schooling. They're always excited when it comes. Even the little ones, they're just like, well, we want to do school too. So okay. it's, yeah. it's a different perspective. I was public schooled, so it's a different. The advantage for me is I, can, I know my children and I know their learning styles. I know Rory does book work really well. Coulter does math really well as far as book work goes. Um, but literacy and reading is really hard for him. So we do a lot more hands-on visual learning documentaries and stuff like that. And then the younger ones are still very sensory based. We use a program called Homegrown Preschooler and it's a lot of outdoor learning, um, nature hikes and scavenger hunts and getting your hands dirty in the mud and finding different types of rocks and stuff. So It's a really cool program. It is. It's awesome. Ours, um, ours okay, so, <laughs> well, I don't know, I guess when we were thinking about this, and it really, it comes down to... Always uh, have a spare tire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had we four, we've one. had four blowouts. In the past yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think, Gosh. I think we're still learning this, so, um, <laughs> we're, we're, I think a lot of our, it has to do weight, weight we're issues. We're missing yeah. our skirting here, because one of the blowouts was so bad, it ripped the whole thing off. And it was like on a freeway, so we couldn't Ooh, no. go back and get it. There was no safe way to go back and try and find it. it, it yeah. just, there was no way to do it, so we just had to just, we, I, I don't know. Okay, wow. so two of our blowouts is because we ran over... Um, oh, the, um, the plastic, plastic wheel chocks. So wheel that's chocks. one lesson we've learned. <laughs> that's one don't lesson use, we've learned. Don't use plastic wheel chocks. So now we do the rubber ones, and so it's just, it's just without fail, we almost... Oh man! Those plastic ones—they they can do <laughs> some damage. When we popped the tire in yeah. Sedona, oh gosh! We didn't know everything looked fine after running over the wheel chalk, and so we drove through Sedona, and then um, the route took us up into Flagstaff, which goes down into like Oak Creek, and it's a really narrow two-lane road. Um, it's winding. It's winding, really? and there's no shoulder, and I it just. I was going slow. I think we were going, the traffic had us like going 25. like 25 miles per hour. And I just heard. There's no cell phone service. We're there's no cell so phone service. I, I, was, I, was following I heard the this van. popping sound. And I'm <laughs> like, I, I can't tell if I pop my tire. I can't see anything. So usually when we see, when I, when I, when we see the blowouts are pretty massive because we're going like freeway speeds, right? And so you, you see all, everything flat and you know you had a blowout. But this one was so funny. I remember just, I remember I saw it and I laughed because it, we were going so slow, just a little. And I was like, I think it was a blowout. <laughs> it was like, and sure enough, it, it lowered. And then we had to pull off and there was there was nothing there. And we were trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to change this? And there was a long line of cars behind us. But then another thing We were family, going around a bend, so I couldn't see in, like what was around the bend at all. Oh, no. Yeah. But... The, well, in this family that was pulling up beside us, they, they, they knew the area. They were from that area. And they were just driving through, and they say, there's a clearing right up here on the right. You're like 100 feet away. Just drive a little bit further. And that's what, sure enough, it was perfect. And this is one of those situations with COVID and everything going on where normally, they told us normally all of those clearings, there's normally cars just backed up all of it. It's normally yeah. packed. But because of COVID and everybody staying home, it was clear. Wow. 
And so we, it was like one of those moments. I, okay, so every blowout that we've had is as crazy as it's been we can we can see god taking care of us in it because again it was one of the situations like if this were any other season we would we would have been in a really bad situation or even if we were a mile up the road going up the mountain we would have had yeah so it was just just perfect for us to pull in the guy he had one of the 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 big four ton jacks and he was like oh i've got a jack here let me grab it and and it was so easy to quickly just change it right there on the spot so but yeah, blowouts have been the really the biggest. That's why I like the travel trailer is because I can do that. I'm I'm starting to notice from doing this. Like in the beginning, we had so many questions of what do we choose, what do we do, and I'm I'm liking doing this now because I know I can do a lot more of the work myself. Mm-hmm. So that's what I like about it. Like I said, even the last time we had a blowout, we were on I-40 going 60 miles an hour, and we had our tire blow out a mile from Klein's Corners, where we knew there was a RV park, park, but there's literally nothing after that. And if you go any further past that that exit, it's a long ways to get to the next exit just to turn around to get back. And our tire blew just right in time for that. And we knew it. We were like, okay, we're good. We just need to get here. And, and, it, and it did. It worked out. It, worked it, out it blew so hard, though, that it ripped out the wiring for the kitchen, so we had no power to our slide. It was uh, 7 o'clock at night, and this is right in the middle of covid and everything was closed down we couldn't yeah, get so all the tire shops are closed we couldn't get a tire we couldn't get a uh, mobile rv person out to us nothing and so it was literally if we had blown that tire a half a mile up past the exit we would have been in a lot of trouble stuck around in the middle of i-40 in pitch black dark um, but we very slowly just pulled the RV off that exit and into Klein's Corners and got parked for the night. He um, we went to go get the kids food before all the food places closed down. We had to go all the way back to almost Albuquerque, which is like... It was, it was a good 40 minute drive. It was a good 40 minute drive just to find food. And then we weren't even sure if the slide was going to open. And without this slide opening, you can't access the bunk room. Uh, the only thing that can be accessed is our room, and that's not enough room for seven people yeah. to sleep. And yeah, so, well, I mean, we... I mean, everything blew the whole like the cable that was pulled out actually wrapped around the axle like two or three times mm. and then yeah. it actually sheared the end of it and so it's like okay i'm kind of worried now about plugging it in if we plug it in if a spark happens you know what's going to happen we weren't and sure so, if there's going to be a fire so it's, it took a little bit of time to get it stable with the blown tire on it i had to get it stable enough to where i could pull it off and then we had to um uh, make sure that nothing was going to catch fire so it took a little while to make sure that the wiring was okay and that we could actually turn everything on luckily the slide worked it came out just fine um, yeah. and we were able to get power on and everything and at that point i think what was it like nine or ten o'clock at night yeah something and that's when I, I was able to finally get all the wiring fixed he pulled out like the electric fireplace and everything um in the slide and he I was tired. The kids went to sleep. I yeah. went to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, he woke me up and he's like, we've got power. I was like, I don't know how you did it, but I'm very thankful you did it. So yeah, it, was, it was interesting. But. I'd say the other big lesson learned was to make sure all the slides are clear before you pull them in. So that bend right there, we had that table on that side. Lengthwise. When, yeah, when it's lengthwise, it lines up perfectly with the outdoor kitchen, so we have extra space. And we were bringing everything in. This is one of those moments where we were running behind oh, and we were hunting so we were trying to rush. rush and stuff i guess that's the other thing is take your time taking time and yeah. really make sure you stick to your routine because we were just like okay let's bring we need to get the slides in as quickly as we can as, as quick as we can pulled in the bunk slide and then this one it's like what's that noise <laughs> and then the, and it was a crunching noise what would that be well, i don't I've know learned, i've learned noises you stop and you go look and so <laughs> fortunately i caught it before it actually bent the slide and ripped so it's still sealed. We need to just go get the body work and get it bent back down. But it was, yeah, that was just one of those instances where we've learned to check because like I store bins underneath too. And if those aren't cleared out of the way, then they get yeah, caught in the slide. Now well. we've got a habit. We check, we double check every time we do a walk around to make sure everything's good. I love traveling, so I, I really have a hard time staying in one spot for too long. Three weeks is probably my limit. Um, I want to see everything and do everything, and I love, I don't know, I love outdoors. I love 
lakes. I love sunsets. I love waterfalls. I love hiking. And so it's just, um, but yeah, my environment has to change constantly. Otherwise I get like really almost agitated. Yeah. So, yeah. you get a little agitated. Um, it oh, I've always was. wanted to do this. So this it, is, it's this a, okay. Been... <laughs> so the whole kind of being forced into it or that, that stage, that was more for me. Yeah. So, cause I, I, I remember, so I think we got married and we moved to, we ended up moving to Houston and I think it was like a couple like a couple weeks after that you were just like hey what if we just bought an RV and just traveled I'm like no no, no. and I, would, I, mean, I don't know with where I grew up I kind of had that picturesque idea of like you know okay I grew up become a responsible adult I need to own a house I need to own a car that's that's kind of what you need to shoot for so that's what I was trying to do you know I had the job working you know climbing the corporate ladder and stuff and doing that and um, um, okay. um, like I said after it, but it took a, like I said it took a little bit for me I mean it here. was it was well I mean the jobs that I had with travel I thought you know it was it was more stressful but then once we figured out the way to make it work and then we started going places and stuff and uh, again, from where I, where I where I grew up, I kind of always had this mentality of like, I'm this is where I'm going to be on this day, and you know, and that that whole like traveling and stuff like that. That's not something that I can attain. It's not attainable for me. And it was an interesting. Owning your own interesting, home wasn't supposed to be attainable. Yeah, for you, so, so it just was. It was it was an interesting mentality switch for me to realize. I mean, I can do this. We can do this. And and it took the time, of, like the jobs that I've had, and then traveling and going to all these different places and all these memories and stuff and, the, and with especially with the phone with it popping up like every year like oh you know last year you did this and stuff like that and that just kind of all of it eventually got to the point where we, we were ready to go and it just kind of just shoved us into that and then ever since then it was it made us work because when I lost that job um, I thought I thought we were going to be okay you know I was going to be able to find another job because um, before that, the longest unemployment that I went through was like two months, and we were fine. And I thought, okay, this is gonna be good. And then because the last job they gave me, um, uh, I had like a pension, I had retirement, stuff like that that we, that we paid. I'd say, okay, we're, we're good for a while. We can be okay. Severance package. Yeah. Everything. And so we said, okay, I've been working straight for for two years. We haven't really done a whole lot. Let's let's just take two weeks. Let's travel up to the Northeast. Let's just do this. And then after that, we're gonna we're gonna hit the ground running with you know finding a job and everything. We'll be okay. And so that's what we did. It was that two week of travel, and I got to see, we got to see the Northeast. I never thought I'd ever go, and that was a huge bucket list for me because I've I've always loved um, the revolutionary period of history. I don't know, but getting to go to all those towns and all the places, the townships, and yeah, seeing the historical sites and stuff like that. We saw Plymouth Rock. We saw. Um, we did the Freedom Trail in Boston. Yeah, that one was really cool. So, but uh, again, traveling up there, um, that really opened my eyes. And then when we came back, of course, after that, it was just all trying to find work and, and, and everything. And it, when that didn't work out, then that's when we went into camping. And at that point, that's when it's like, let's just let's just do this. And let's just see how we go. So, yeah. For me, though, I grew up watching the show Promised Land. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It was on CBS. Very short-lived show, but it was about a family who the guy, the dad, lost his job and they lost everything, and they bought this little airstream, and it was him and his wife, his two kids, and his mother, and they became um, traveling missionaries. Basically, they um, drove around the country in their RV and um, got jobs wherever they could and served people wherever they could, and that was kind of like all that was my dream growing up. But I could never get him on board. Well, she, and... she even said, she said, hey, come come sit down and watch this with me. And, we'll, we'll it. and I'm like, okay, we're not doing it, but okay. <laughs> but that was, I know, I know. It was in God's plan, definitely, because... It, it took, there's, there's a lot that we had to go through, a lot of growing. There's a lot of, I mean, we couldn't jump right into it, you know, back then. There was a lot more that we had to grow uh and not only in our mentality but even just in our inner faith um because every every step of the way it was it was lessons being learned along the way and ultimately it's been knowing that god provides he provides everything he provides 
um, the place for us to stay, the food for eat, and that's what that's what we tell our kids. I mean, we, when we pray every day, we're like, we need to be thankful because God, once again, we, we came to an, the end of another day where we had a place to stay, we had food to eat, and we're together as a family. Yeah. And it's just those situations, and we've got hundreds of stories just of the little things where it's like, okay, well, we, this is this is a need that we have. You know, how, how do we meet this need? And we say, okay, we need to pray. We pray, and then God meets the need in some way or another. And it's just... Yeah, there was that one time we didn't know how we were going to pay a bill, and we just prayed about it, and he gave a lift ride to a guy who was this, apparently a millionaire. Well, he, well yeah, because <laughs> uh, I remember we needed, like, $400. No, it wasn't that much. It was like three fifty, three fifty, something yeah. like that. And so, and then we, we ended up in Gallup. And at the time, I was lifting and Ubering for work, and that's what we were doing to make ends meet. And as long as I'm in a major in a major town or something like that, it, it works out perfectly. But Gallup's not really a major town. It and is this teeny tiny town in the middle of New Mexico. But it. I think you were the, the only well, lift driver. I was like the only one there, and so I wasn't getting. I, I get like maybe two rides on a weekend, and that was it. And it's just like on a Wednesday or something. So it was the middle of the week, and it's like normally I won't get a ride. But I was like, okay, I'll turn the app on and we'll see what happens. And it's like we were in a situation where we had to be there. We couldn't. I couldn't go to Albuquerque or anything like that. And so it's like we're on this time frame. It's like, well, I mean, God's going to provide. That's the only way that this can work out is if God provides. That's the only way. And so we just we prayed about it. Said, God, this is what we need. You, you have to make it happen. We, we trust in you. We believe in you. We know you're in control. And you know. And that's it. I mean, and so that day I get a call for a ride. I go to pick him up, and he jumps in. Literally, the first thing he says, I'm a millionaire. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, you know, I mean, well, I mean, at this point, I'd given, given enough rides that I've, I've met questionable passengers before. So Especially it was in gonna, Gallup. Yeah, so I was like, okay, sure, that's fine. Okay, let's, where, where are we going, you know? And so I, I started taking him on the ride, and it was like a 15 minute ride. Um, and so he starts telling me this, this story about how his dad had just recently passed away who he didn't really get to know like he, he knew him when he was younger but then they kind of grew estranged um, but his dad was actually incredibly rich and he didn't really know that side of his dad's life but he left everything to him and so he got this This had happened like maybe a month before and he was just like I don't know what to do with all this money and I just you know I, I didn't realize my dad cared for me enough to. and so we, we got into some, some deep conversations and everything and, and through talking through it um, well, he, he the reason why he I needed to give him a ride, I was giving him a ride to a car dealership because his motorcycle had mysteriously broken down just right there in Gallup. <laughs> so I, he needed to buy a truck and a trailer. And he and then I get there, and he was just like, hey, you know, why don't you stay with me? Help me pick out a truck, and we can talk and stuff. And I was like, I'm not doing anything else. And <laughs> so, I mean, I called her just let her know, like, hey, you know, don't pick out a truck. And, you know, and she was just like, okay. All right. <laughs> Don't get killed. Yeah, she was, <laughs> sounds so weird, was, but okay. It, it was really weird, and I just was like, "Well, let's let's just go with it." And so I started talking with them. I helped him out, and you know, we we drove, test drove a couple of trucks, and he picked one that he liked. And when he got the keys at the end of the day, he was just like, "Okay." He's like, "Hey, thanks for your help, you know, for the time and everything." And he just handed me four hundred fifty dollars in cash. He was like, "Here." There you go. We didn't say like, anything about our financial problems. He was just there helping him. And he just handed us four hundred and fifty dollars in cash, and, and, so. yeah, and I had just enough time to go put it in the bank, and then we had we got the bill paid on time. Yeah. And wow. so we have so many instances like that, including how we led into ministry too. Well, that was so, kind of that was the big thing that led us into to the ministry was all these faith building things got us to a point where I think um, we we're just uh, well at, at that point we. It was pretty much ingrained in us. God just kind of let us know, hey, I'm providing for you. I'm taking care of you. Just trust in me. And it was just instance after instance of that process. And that's what led us into the going into ministry. This is a summer camp that's south of Gallup. And uh, it's called Broken Arrow Bible Ranch. And we actually, that's where we met. So I went to, I, I went there as a camper in the summer once when I was younger. And then... I had a friend of mine in high school that used to work there, and then when after my senior year, she was like, hey, you should come and check it out and work for a week. And I said, okay, great. And so I went, and it just, it's a really, really unique ministry opportunity because it, it grows your faith so much. The, the people there, the people in leadership, they really teach and ingrain all the staff there, and all the staff are volunteers. They just ingrain in them 
that the fact that it's one summer is like a microcosm of what life is really like and it's it's you're going to be put through trials for the summer you're going to be put through situations that's going to drain you physically mentally emotionally and spiritually so what are you going to do how are you going to get through this is your trust in yourself is your trust in, in what you do or is it in god and they work with you on devotions they work with you on um on, on prayer and just kind of really it really does put you through the fire in terms of what you're going to go through in life and that's where we met that's where uh we actually got married there and th that that was actually the last time we were there was when we were married and we didn't really get much of a chance to go back we always wanted to we would talk about like you know every now and then while we were like in houston or wherever we were living we were like wouldn't it be great if we could go back and serve for a summer it would be great to do this again and we just we, we just could never make it work it's like well i have to work we have to make money we're building a life and you know and trying to make that work and we finally got this opportunity and we said, okay, let's do it. We have the finances to carry through this, but then we can we have to leave after this this week. So we, um, I think I, I remember being like a couple days into it and just thinking, you know, I, we, I want to stay for the summer. I want I want to be here for the whole summer because you see, even if it's just a little bit of an impact, but you see the kids come in, you see the campers come in, and, and seeing how they get touched and. You, see where they come from these are campers that come from really really bad homes um it's right in the middle of uh several different uh southwestern reservations including navajo hopi zuni uh, supai wallapai um, and so all these kids come from majority of them come from homes of alcohol and drug abuse uh, sexual abuse 85 percent of the kids on the reservation will be sexually abused before they turn 18. And so they, they come into this camp as kind of their only real reprieve from the hecticness of their lives. Just being there even just for a little short amount of time, you, you get to see the fruit of, of that uh, of work and effort and working with other, other believers in, in that situation and, and really seeing kids' lives change and getting, seeing them impacted. And so, uh, again, we were just... We didn't want to just spend a short amount of time here. We said, we really want to be here all summer. And then we started th talking about it. And I said, well, what do we need? What do we need to be able to do this? And uh, we, we crunched the numbers and we figured out we needed... Like, $1,940 some odd dollars. Yeah. And so it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. And right. so it's just like, okay. And then, uh, again, we just prayed and we said, God, this is what we want to do. We want to be able to do this. And there's no way that I can make this amount of money in this short amount of time to be able to serve and do this. It was the situation where we couldn't do it ourselves. We couldn't do it on our own. It's like, okay, God, we've seen you do it before. You provided for us, and this is what we want to do. And if we're going to make this work, the only way that we can do it is if, if you make it work, if you, if you provide that. And so I remember we asked some people to pray with us and stuff. And um, We didn't tell anybody how much we needed. Yeah. We just asked people to pray if this was really where God wanted us to be if this is that it'll be that'll happen the it'll be an obvious answer um, yeah. and direction but it's somebody from one of the churches that supports the camp there and they've, they've been there for a while and I think um, they, they came out and they met with us and they said hey you know we, we feel like this is what God wants us to do with with this money that, that we've been given and they handed it to us and it was two thousand dollars in the envelope and it was just like <laughs> So later that month, uh, somebody that works at the camp approached Daryl and said, I don't know why I didn't think about this before. Well, this, is, this was like the last week. Yeah, it was I the remember. last week It was the camp. last week of camp. Um, it was like that Tuesday. Because at this point, we were faced with the same dilemma from the first week we were there. It was like, okay, we got to figure out where we're going. And we only had enough money to get us through that last week of camp. And so we were trying to figure out, we were praying and trying to figure out what's going to happen after that. And so... Um, at that point, we'd been praying so long for trying to find a job that would work for us and that, that I'd be able to actually work in and, and it would it'd be enough and everything. And so we get to like that, that week and then the, the, one of the administrators says, hey, you know, missionary the, or the mission organization, they actually need somebody that works in IT. And they said, I don't know why to think about it. I know that's what you were doing, but this would, this would probably be a good fit. But in order for you, the best time for you to try to you know, to, to talk with them is actually going to be the next week. They have a missions conference that they have. And so the director of the organization was going to be there 
um, as well as the person that works in the IT and everything from their side. And they said, they're going to be here, but if this, is, if this is something you want to do, you really should be here for that week. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, we, we, need, we need more money. Was, <laughs> so it's like, okay. It was the first of the month, and we had so many bills that were automatically coming out that week. And it was just like... We need, but again, I mean, we we'd seen what God did early in the summer. It's like, okay, this is we just do the same thing. Let's just let's find out how much we need, and let's let's get it on paper. Let's get let's figure out the dollar amount. And we'll pray about it, and if this is where God wants us, if this is where He's leading us, then then it's it's going to happen. Um, the camp actually has a scholarship fund for natives that work for the summer. As long as you work at least five weeks and mm-hmm. you're native, those are the only stipulations. So I'm native. And he we worked just for completed five weeks. Was it five weeks yes. or six weeks or something? I don't remember. But then they so they gave me a check. Like they, it was like the next day. And they said, Oh hey, you know, we put your name in for this since you've been here. Here you go. And, and everything was like, Okay, awesome, this is great. It wasn't enough. But it was like, Okay, this is something. We it's still like, need okay. like two hundred and fifty dollars yeah. more on top so, of that. So. But then um, my uncle right who's in California actually contacted my mom earlier that week and stuff and, and she my mom had kind of just told him what we were doing and he just said hey you know I wanted to reach out and, he, and he, my mom's your mom's told me what you guys have been doing so I wanted to help you guys I wanted to bless you guys and like after everything was said and done it was like an extra 50 bucks from what we, what we actually prayed for and so it's like okay this is obviously where we need to be this is obviously where we need to go God it was it was really clear absolutely clear at that point and I remember sitting down and talking with the director. I remember very clearly when he says, part of this process, part of this life, going into this, you have to go in with the understanding that God is your provider, that he's going to provide for you, because that's that's the mission organization. You have to have that mindset. Oh and it was like, hey, great, we're, we're kind of already there. You know, we're, that's, that's... Mommy, I it was literally that moment of like, well, I mean, the, 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 that's when it clicked for me that everything that we'd been through from that point up and leading up to that was God preparing us for this. And it's just one of those hindsight things, and it's just one of those things where it just all clicks. And it's like, okay, God, I get it. So because of COVID, well, because of what life is like on the reservation, um, Many of the homes are still without water, electric, and modern plumbing. Um, and many homes have several family, like um, it's not just an immediate family that's living in a home. Sometimes, oftentimes it's uh, the elders, it's aunts, uncles, cousins. And so oftentimes you'll have as many as four or five families living in like a three bedroom home. And so um, because of this and because water is scarce um, and limited out there, um, any type of <laughs> any type of uh, disease that uh, gets onto the reservation usually does more damage than it does in um, the rest of the United States. And so I think SARS, the uh, um, death toll with Navajo Nation was four or five times um, larger than the rest of the country um, per like 100 people or something. And um, they, in an effort to kind of slow COVID um, from running rampant there, they uh, pretty much shut down the entire reservation. And um, Navajo, they're still on lockdown now. Um, On Navajo Nation is about the size of West Virginia, the whole entire state, and they only have 12 grocery stores. So most people have to travel several hours just to fill a tank of water on the back of their truck. Um, and with all the hand washing that they're wanting people to do, thank you, um, with all the hand washing and everything, it's just not enough water to go around and people are limited in how they can get to the store. The food supply was limited out there. And so um, we were working with an organization called Navajo Nation Christian Response Team. Um, and they were doing a food drive. We left our... Um, the ministry headquarters in Glendale, Arizona, as it was starting to get a little too hot to be in the Phoenix area. Um, And we decided to go help his mom. His mom was struggling getting toilet paper and other necessities and food and stuff. So we decided that we were gonna head back to Texas, but that we'd stop over in Gallup and make sure she was taken care of. Um, We stopped in Gallup and found out that there was a need for volunteers to help unpack trucks coming in and um, 
yeah, sanitize to... boxes of food and repack them to ta be taken out of the reservation. So we decided to extend our stay there. Uh, we were only supposed to stay a day or two, and I think we ended up staying a week and a half. Yeah. Um, and going almost every day to help uh, process food donations. But something we were seeing is that there was not enough like canned food coming in. There was not enough of certain types of food necessary to pack these boxes. And so we knew that we had quite a, um, a network of churches and connections in the state of Texas. And so we reached out to um, a couple of people through Navajo Nation Christian Response Team and were like, well, um, what if we went back to Texas and got donations to come back this way? Um, we made plans to uh, go ahead and come out here. We connected with um, North Point Christian Church, which is our home church in the Dallas area, um, and another church, um, and connected with another person on Facebook that I've never met before, but they heard about what we were doing, and they contacted a bunch of other people, and so all of a sudden, um, this, what was supposed to be a small food drive turned into a very large <laughs> food drive, but I think we packed probably about seven, 8,000 pounds of food into a U-Haul trailer and hauled it out to, um, Navajo Nation, what was that, four weeks ago now? Because Navajo Nation's continuing their lockdown, more donations may be needed again, um, but that's actually the the Christian response was actually it, it came out of the organization that we work with, which is um, United Indian Missions, and so that's that's the mission organization that we're a part of. And they they started that process when everything started happening, and it's um, there's a few people that are in the Gallup area, the people that we worked with at the camp, and everything that are actually. <laughs> That would be through uh, the uh -huh. UIM website. UIM.org backslash donate. Yeah, and there's a box, because um, they accept donations for all their missionaries as well as their different projects and stuff that they have going through under them, um, including their, including the Navajo Nation Christian Response Week, and I think that they're doing it there. Um, but just if you just put our last name, Wero, um, in the box and click donate, then you can pay through PayPal, um, credit card, or... Uh, they even have an address that you can actually send checks to and stuff like that. Um, we currently have another project going on right now, uh, not necessarily us, but um, our the summer camp would usually be open and running. That's where we would be right now during the summer. Um, but because of everything going on, they had to cancel camp for the summer. And to kind of... Uh, still be able to reach kids and youth in the area. They've put together camper bags, um, so they're little backpacks with t-shirts and devotionals and fun activities and stuff, um, encouragement things to send out um, to the different campers. There's a lot of need in that because a lot of campers don't have like uh, mailing addresses out on the reservation. So there's some obstacles that need to be overcome in getting camper bags to kids. So there's a lot of prayer need for that. Um, but there's also, usually the camp has work teams and retreats during the springtime to help raise funds for the summer. Um, and they have a, a scholarship fund for campers because a lot of the campers can't afford to go to camp. Um, so they are taking um, sponsorships for camper bags right now through July 3rd, I think it is. It's $30 a camper bag to send a bag out to a child. Um, and that can also... Same place. Uh, yeah, uim.org backslash donate, but Broken Arrow Bible Ranch would be what you would put in the box for that. <laughs> well, right now we're doing, it's continuing to raise support, it's continuing to, to travel and, and, and make connections where, we're, where we can. Um, I'm functioning on a limited capacity right now with the organization until we can get fully fully supported. And so we're, we've got a couple different travel plans right now. Mainly, actually, we're going to be taking my mom with us. She's got some bucket list items that she wants to do, like Graceland. So we're going to try to see if we can get her out there and... Um, spend some time with her um, 
and everything. So, because she's been, she's just been at home this whole time. So she's been really wanting to kind of get out. So we're going to take her with us and travel and then uh, raise support at the same time. And then we're also going to be, uh, there's another project actually with the camp we're hoping that we can still do this fall. Uh, we did it last fall. We did, uh, well, part of the, the, everything in the camp is all, um, it's from everybody that's there is missionaries that, that work there. and It's um, all volunteer based. Yeah, so. a lot of the project stuff they, they do is on a volunteer basis. And so last fall we went and we did uh, a bunch of projects that they did. We built new picnic tables, picnic benches. We uh, painted. painted. We um, sealed roofs. There's stacked stand, firewood so. we there's a lot of stuff there was, so, there's a lot of projects that have to be done out uh, there we actually partnered with full-time families we got a lot of people from the full-time families uh traveling mercies branch and we got them all out there we got what like 10 10 or 11 families uh, there was initially 10 or 11 families that registered but i think we only had eight families in the end um which was a good it was a good amount of people we got so we many got projects knocked out even the kids the kids all jumped in and they did a bunch of stuff it was a lot of fun but so. we're hoping to do that again this fall and after that we're hoping to be able to get to um back to the mission organization that's in it's in glendale so we're looking to be back there in january and then i can uh again as long as all the funding's in place we'll be able to that be there but so that's that's going to be the plan is to be there um for a couple months in the winter uh, and going forward again as long as we can get to the full support we'll be there for the winters we'll be at the camp for the summers and then the rest of the time we'll be uh, raising support or bouncing between all the other missions so UIM has like an aviation program they've got a, a youth camp in Canada they got a youth camp in Mexico they've got uh, food kitchens in Cuba and also in Mexico, so they have a lot of ministries everywhere, and um, our main job is going to be meeting the IT needs of all the ministries, and so um, spring and fall is going to be bouncing back and forth between the different ministries and kind of helping them with whatever IT needs that they have. I know that's a tough one to pick. It is. It's really hard because Put you on the spot. it's. It really is. It's hard. It's hard because there's little things that we like about. It. I think I'd have to name at least three. Go for it. Number number one is the northeast. Like I said, because earlier, I mean, it's just something about the history in the area. I love. That's what kick started us into this. At least for me, again, it was. That's what really made me really say, okay, let's do this. So we're, we have plans to go back there later on this year. Uh, so that's one. And we've only been there once. We want to do it again. Two has to. Be, I have to say New Mexico because of green chili and Blake's Lot of Burgers breakfast burritos. That's that's number two for me. And number three for me is Texas, just because that's where. But you grew up in New Mexico. It's the breakfast burritos. It's. I can't. I have. Food is everything. It is the food's it a part really of it. Is. I mean, and that's well. That's the other thing I love about doing this is the food. And then, I mean, we hit, when we were in Louisiana, we got to eat crocodile sausage. Yeah. Um, we did a little bit of the Cuban food in Florida when we were there. Um, so that's kind of part of what our name, Wero Party of Seven, is. Is just whenever we go into a restaurant. Right. So yeah. What's your name, Wero? <laughs> How many in your party? Seven. So yeah. um, we don't get to eat out as much anymore. But we do love trying new places. We love trying new food. Yeah, at least trying. I mean, we, that's that was part of the, actually the curriculum that she did when we were first starting traveling was... Uh, Road Trip USA. Yeah. And each state, um, along with studying it, studied the culture and the food of that state. And so um, any new state we go to, we try and... Um, whatever the food is. Whatever the food is. Boston cream pies and <laughs> Boston. So it's... Um, we went to Philadelphia and actually had a Philly cheesesteak Nothing. there. And it doesn't, it tastes different than any of the, you get a Philly cheesesteak at any other yeah. place. I mean, the, it's it's the same ingredients, but there's something about it. I, I, I didn't believe it until I tried it there. Buffalo's mm -hmm. where we got hooked on Buffalo oh wings. My gosh. <laughs> so that was part of one of my jobs that I had. I, I was up in Buffalo for about a month and they put me up there January, February. So it was snowing. I think the, the only day, it only, it snowed almost every day except for three days that we were there so it was constant snow all the time and we almost we didn't go out as much because of that we, we went to we went to the niagara falls oddly enough that was interesting yeah um 
but in the snow <laughs> yeah in the snow it was really cool seeing in the snow there was like nobody there but it was really awesome but there was like three, let's say it was two feet of snow wow yeah it was so funny I remember I actually took which one was the baby then was it Tempe yes I think I actually tossed her in a pile of snow and she disappeared <laughs> <laughs> so she wasn't there she didn't see that but that was fun um I don't but, think she wants to hear no, about no, that. No, no, no. It was, it was a waste because she literally did just disappear. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, um, but, so because of that, we didn't, we, it wasn't like a normal, hey, let's go out and get some food kind of a thing. But So we ordered delivery like four, time, four times every week. And it we was found always buffalo wings. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, food. yeah. So I mean, that's it. I mean, yeah, to answer your question, long story short, I mean, that's that's probably some of the places. That's for me anyway. I guess it's Northeast New Mexico, yeah. and Texas for sweet tea and. I mean, one of my favorite things that we've done is tent camping in the Everglades. Ooh. Yeah. That was fun. <laughs> so everybody thought we were crazy camping with the crocodiles, but it was it was an experience. It really was. It was a lot of fun. Tempe, Tempe was the one. She, she really wanted to see a crocodile, and we said, "Okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna try and see one. We're gonna do everything we could. Every chance we got, we went to a couple of national parks where they're supposed to be known for them, and we never saw them. Not until we got to we were pulling into the campground, and as there was this long road, and we were just driving along, and sure enough, there's like two of them that were sitting on the side of the road." And so we pulled out and we, we, we you know. Uh, we only got Tempe out of the car because it, it had been all year long. Her, that's all she could talk about was seeing an alligator or a crocodile. And so she, that, man, that made her year, I think. Yeah, we did. went, we did all of Louisiana too, searching for <laughs> crocodiles. We didn't see anything. But I think, I think that's, the, I mean, that kind of, to touch on that point, um, when you're talking about transitioning the kids, beforehand, I remember she was really purposeful about asking them, we're going to be traveling this is what we're going to be doing think of something that you want to do think of something that you really want and we'll see about making it happen and that was for her that for tempe that was one that was she wants to see an alligator and i remember for rory okay, so this is the one i have to i have to go into this story um she brought that proposition up to them and stuff and i think i don't know if she was just trying to make it seem impossible or whatnot but i remember because she really didn't want to go but she was like i want to touch a cloud and i was like okay I don't know how we're going to do it, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> and on our trek going up towards Blue Northeast, Ridge Parkway. Uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway, and that winding road, I remember, I still remember. And we woke up one morning kind of in Asheville, I think, before, because we, we were staying in Asheville, and we were going to do Blue Ridge Parkway the next day, and we woke up early in the morning, and it was really dense fog. Well, we were driving into the mountains. Clouds. Asheville is a mountain. Yeah. Time. And so, but Rory got out of the car and Go put it, back. it just, Go put it, back. It, I, it can't really be described as fog. It, it can only be described as being up in the clouds. And she just, she reached up and she touched the clouds and she just, sure, yeah. she started crying and she was just so happy. And I was like. I didn't know how we were going to help her touch a cloud. I didn't know that this was going to be possible, but I mean, that just made everything for her. That that first time I decided to just pack everything up one night because I couldn't handle it anymore being a single mom and take off. I drove the first day straight through from Dallas to Memphis. We stayed the night there in a hotel. And then I was, I was determined to make it from Memphis to Lexington, North Carolina, which is where he was. And, but I had did no planning. I, this was so, like, I'm the spontaneous one. <laughs> so I was just like, I'm just gonna do this. I'm not gonna worry about anything. It's just, we're just gonna get there. And um, it was getting dark. And um, this, it was after the time change, I think. So it was getting mm -hmm. dark early. And I called him and I'm like, I have no idea where I am, but I'm feeling really lightheaded. I feel like I'm gonna pass out. There, I can't see anything around me. It's pitch black dark. It's foggy. There's trucks like they're just racing past me. And, and I was in a panic and was, there was no place to pull off. There was no shoulder. And I was just like, I, I'm afraid I'm going to die. <laughs> like I've got the kids in the car and I'm really sorry if I don't see you. I love you. And it was just like it was this whole thing. And then um, I lost service. Yeah. And oh no. yeah, so I was on the other <laughs> end of the phone like, um, <laughs> And all of a sudden, I see the sign that says Great Smoky Mountains, like elevation, so many thousand feet. I was like, oh, 
That explains my lightheadedness. <laughs> Maybe if I had done a little bit of research, I would know where I was headed into and where I was going. And so we finally get over the mountain. I think I pulled off in Asheville and called him. I was like, okay, we're fine. We're at McDonald's. <laughs> we'll be there in about two hours. Yes. Well, this was really nice talking with you guys. Yeah. yeah. I definitely appreciate you sitting down with us and telling your story. It was nice getting to know you guys a little bit more, yeah. so other than just in passing. Yeah. But. Okay, so that went real well. In fact, it went so well that we think we're going to need to go ahead and split this interview up into a part one and a part two. Um, they had so much great information to share, and we don't want to water it, any down. Of it out to short to shorten it. So. If you guys want to see more of the interview go ahead and check out part two and I really appreciate you watching go ahead and subscribe hit that like button uh, hit the notification bell if you want to be notified every time we put up a new video and leave a comment thank you bye <laughs> Tegan do you want to say something yeah what do you want to say you say it into the microphone Okay. Can you sing your song? Hey. <laughs> what do you like about traveling? They didn't know. You don't know? No. What do you like about the RV? I didn't know. You say bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. Say bye. Why don't you wave bye to the camera? It's up there.